lovely art people, grab your art tools of choice because it's time for another tutorial video. I've made videos in the past talking about a lot of aspects of making comics, how to write them, things you should consider when doing page layouts, programs that are good for drawing, the backend work that goes into making web comics specifically, etc. One thing I've never really covered is the entire comic page process, all the steps that go into making a single comic page from start to finish. And I figured that would be really good information for newbie comic artists who are maybe unsure of how comics are done, or folks with some experience under their belts who just want to see how other comic artists do their thing. So that's what I'm doing today. I'm going to take you through the process of drawing an entire page of my webcomic cast off all the way through from beginning to end and point out some useful tools and shortcuts that will help make your life easier. For some really quick context, if you're unaware, I write and draw a fantasy adventure webcomic called Cast Off, and in today's video, we'll be drawing the first page of the upcoming 12th chapter. Links to read the comic are down in the description, by the way. Wink. Also, in a crazy plot twist, this video is the channel's first ever sponsored video, brought to you by none other than my art program of choice, Clip Studio Paint. I switched to using Clip Studio a few years ago, and it has so many tools and functions that make my life so much easier. I'll be sure to point those out as we go through the video, so keep your eyes and ears open. And without further ado, let's get into it. When making a comic, I always start with a script. I typically script several chapters ahead of the scenes I'm actually drawing. And I should note here that I'm talking about graphic novel length chapters. A chapter of Cast Off can be anywhere from 40 to over 100 pages, and to give you an idea of how far ahead I script, at the time of making this video, I'm in the process of drawing chapter 12, but I've outlined the broad strokes of the entire story and I'm already working on scripts for the next several chapters. Scripting so far ahead gives me a lot of time to think about the story and make plenty of edits and tweaks to the writing before actually drawing the comic pages. I like to put a lot of thought and nuance into my scripts, and my comic is a long-form, continuous story, so writing out scripts really far in advance lets me continuously add and change things if I'm hit with inspiration. In fact, I've often had pretty big breakthroughs with the story from working this far ahead, like writing a scene and then being able to go back and add foreshadowing a few chapters before that. I also like to keep my scripts accessible from anywhere and usually use a program that I can access from my phone over the internet. That way, if inspiration strikes while I'm away from my computer, I can jot down the ideas before I forget them. As for formatting my scripts, I usually use a pretty simple layout as shown here. I just use the first letter of each character's name, write out their dialogue, and make a new line every time someone new talks. I also type out movements, expressions, and ideas for stage directions into the script as well. Basically, if I have an idea for how I want the page to look at this stage, this is where I write it down. After the script, it's time to move on to a very underrated step of the process, thumbnails. Thumbnails are basically the absolute earliest sketches of a comic page. They're good for planning layouts and hashing out ideas in a quick and dirty fashion. Your thumbnails should be simple and messy. If you spend too much time on them, you'll be hesitant to change them if you come up with a better idea. A good thumbnail is flexible. This is the stage where you want to throw ideas around and wrangle your thoughts onto the paper as fast as possible. Don't be afraid to try multiple iterations of the same page. If you aren't feeling a page layout, you can scrap it and try again. Like I said, this is the time to be loose and messy. I typically do thumbnails in batches. I'll thumbnail out an entire scene all at once, then draw that scene, then thumbnail the next scene, etc., etc. I have the script open in another window while I'm doing my thumbnails, and I'll go through and break my scripts into pages as I thumbnail. I know some comic artists break their scripts into pages during the writing process, but since I make a web comic that doesn't have to stick to strict page counts, I prefer to do it this way. I feel like it gives me more control over the pacing and flow of certain scenes, and sometimes it's hard to tell how much can or should fit onto one page until you're actually thumbnailing it. After the thumbnails for the scene are done, now I head over into page formatting. I have a template saved to my computer that has the safe working area marked out. And since I get this question all the time, I'll go ahead and address it here. What size should you use for your comic pages? Big. Bigger than they need to be. My advice is to always draw everything at print resolution, even if you don't think you'll ever want to print it. 300 dpi, or dots per inch, is the minimum resolution for printing, so you'll want to start there. By default, your program will probably be set to 72 dpi, which is fine for web stuff, but you'll want to go higher for potentially printed material. 
it's always better to have your comics at a nice big print resolution and never print your comic than to decide down the road you want to print them but have your pages be too small for printing. That's what happened to me with my first webcomic, and I do not recommend it. Also, as for the exact dimensions of your pages, I'm not going to give you exact pixel dimensions because I personally think that's gonna limit you too much. You need to understand why you're making your pages that size, right? So I recommend looking up standard comic page sizes and templates. There's a few commonly used sizes and templates for comic pages, whether it's traditional Western comic page size, manga size, US trade size, or what have you. And hey, Clip Studio actually comes with several built-in comic page templates of various sizes, which is pretty dang handy. If you're unsure which size is the best for you, I recommend going to your local bookstore and checking out the different book sizes in their comic and graphic novel section. What size feels good to you? What size could you imagine reading your own comic at? And again, even if you don't think you'll ever print your comic, it's a good idea to at least humor yourself in the early stages. If you format your pages for print when you're drawing them, you'll save yourself a lot of time reformatting them later if and when you decide to make a book. That's what I'm struggling with right now. My early cast off pages from like 2015 didn't leave enough room for print bleed, so I had to go back and reformat over 200 pages for the eventual first volume and I'm dying inside. So back to page formatting. I usually do the thumbnails for an entire scene all at once. Then for each page of the scene I just thumbnailed, I'll duplicate my page template, copy the thumbnail onto the page, and expand it so it fits the full safe area. Now that each thumbnail is on its own page, we're ready to start the next step, lettering. Wait, Star, you do your lettering this early? Isn't it a little too soon? I haven't even drawn anything yet. No, now is the best time to do your lettering. Trust me on this one. On a comic page, your words are just as important as your pictures, and a well thought out comic page allows plenty of space for both. The last thing you want is to spend hours on the art for a page and then have to cover it up because you didn't leave enough room for the lettering. Your words and pictures shouldn't fight each other, they should work together. And the best way to institute a positive relationship between your art and your words is the same way you'd introduce two cats to each other. Introduce them early so they can get used to each other and make sure they each have their own space. To that end, I do my lettering before I even start sketching. I go back to my script and copy paste all the dialogue that'll go onto each page. Then I drop it where it should go on the page and adjust my thumbnails if needed. One thing that makes this go a little faster is that you can set text presets in Clip Studio. So I have one set up for my comic text. All I have to do is select that specific preset and blam, it automatically switches to the correct font, font size, line spacing, etc which makes it super easy to keep my lettering consistent across all my comic pages. Now that all my words are on the page, if I need to change up the layout for a page slightly to make room for the lettering, I can easily do so by tweaking the thumbnails before I ever even start sketching. I usually just do the text at this point and don't add the word balloons until later. No particular reason why, that's just how I like to do it. We'll come back to this after the sketches are done. Now, there's one more step I usually like to do at this stage incorporating 3D models. For complex environments like interior scenes or scenes with a lot of architecture or details to keep consistent, I personally enjoy making 3D models to use as a reference. I make mine from scratch in Blender, but I've also used apps like Room Sketcher for interior scenes. And if you don't have the means to make 3D models yourself, Clip Studio has a bunch of ready-made 3D assets in its library you can use to build out your scenes. But Star isn't tracing over 3D models cheating? No. No. Shh. Your brain has been poisoned by the bad thoughts. Get that type of talk out of here. Shoot, be gone. While using 3D models is no replacement for learning your perspective and environment drawing fundamentals, it's an extremely useful tool to not only assist with perspective, but also to help keep environments consistent when drawing a scene from multiple angles. Plus, I've found that I've been able to get way more creative with my camera angles when I have a reliable 3D background model to work from. Like, these shots would never have been in the comic if I didn't have a 3D model to reference. They save you a ton of time and headaches, and I highly recommend learning your way around Blender, Clip Studio's primitive 3D tools, pre-made assets and models, or something similar so you can make environment or prop models to use for your comic. Whatever way you like to make them, this is the point where I go in, using my thumbnails as reference, and start grabbing stills from my 3D modeling software and adding them to my panels. That way, when I start sketching, I can sketch over the 3D models and keep everything consistent. This saves a ton of time during the sketching process, so I highly recommend it. 
Since a large portion of this chapter is going to take place in the same handful of rooms, I hashed out a quick and dirty blender model that I can use to take screenshots of and draw over for my backgrounds. Once I've got my thumbnails, lettering, and 3D reference all placed where they need to be, the next step after that is sketching, which I think is pretty self-explanatory. Sometimes I'll make page layout tweaks during the sketch phase, but usually I'm just drawing straight on top of my thumbnails. Once the sketch is done, I go back in and finalize the lettering. I do the final tweaks to text location and add in my word balloons. If I need to adjust the sketch further at this point, I do, but usually the only adjustment needed is making a character a little smaller or moving them over slightly. That's why we do our lettering before the sketch, so we don't have to make any major changes after we've already sketched a page. Once I'm satisfied with the sketch and word bubble layout, I start inking. I usually do all my panel borders using the Clip Studio Paint panel tools, then lock that layer so I don't accidentally mess with it. Really quick, here's how I personally use the panel tool. First, block out the full area your panels will occupy with the Create Frame tool. You can also use the tool properties to adjust the line width and other things. Then I use the Cut Frame tool to slice that big panel into a bunch of smaller panels based on my sketch. Again, you can adjust the settings with the Tool Property menu. This is how you adjust how much space you cut between the panels. Now, you can use the panels like this and move on from here. But I personally like having just the panel borders on their own layer without any of the extra little doodads. So I right click on the Frame Layer folder, hit Rasterize, and then delete all the extra layers. And now I have a nice pretty layer with my panel borders on it, and I lock this layer so I don't accidentally move it around. Then I make a new layer to do all my inks. I typically do the line art for my characters on one layer and the line art for my backgrounds on another layer. This makes things a little easier if I need to tweak placements later. Also, another question I get a lot is what brushes I use for inking. Well, completely honest and very boring answer, 99% of my inking is done with Clip Studio's default hard round brush, which they call the G-Pen. I made a few tweaks to the pen pressure settings to accommodate for how hard I press down when I draw, but other than that, I'm a basic default brush girly. Inking usually takes me between one to three hours, depending on how detailed the page is. And hey, did you know that I stream myself inking comic pages sometimes? It's true. Check the live tab on my page to see the archive drawing streams and check out the time for my next art stream. I do them pretty regularly, so come hang out with me while I draw if you want. Anyway, once the inks are done, now it's time to do flat colors. One layer for character flats, one for background flats. One thing that I've started doing recently is making pre-planned color palettes for each scene of the comic. That way I can change the character's flats for each scene and they require less fiddling during the coloring phase. I usually put this together before I start drawing each scene of the comic. I'll grab references of color schemes, photos, or illustrations I like that I think match the atmosphere of the scene, then put together a color palette with all the flat colors for the characters and backgrounds. I usually make little reference images like this and they make it really quick and easy to grab the colors I need without needing to color pick off of a tiny reference or just abstract blobs of color. Then I save that color palette into a reference file and I'll keep that reference file open in Clip Studio's subview window. The subview is really handy for keeping reference images readily available while drawing. And if you click the little eyedropper in the subview tool, when you hover over the window, it'll automatically switch you to the eyedropper tool and you can really quickly grab the color you need to fill in your flats. It makes flatting so much faster. Another tool that helps flatting go faster is my BFF, the fill bucket. Some people hate the fill bucket tool because it doesn't work with their art style or whatever, but I'm fully of the belief that those folks could use it if they just got the settings tweaked to suit their art style, like so. When coloring, I make a new layer underneath my line art for my flat colors. Then I go to town with the fill bucket. Here's the settings I use for mine. Area scaling turned up to about 10 with refer multiple checked off and scaling mode set to two darkest pixel. Area scaling lets the colors bleed under your line art a little bit, which gets rid of the nasty transparent halo around your line art you might encounter when you use the fill bucket. I use a thicker line art style and usually set it at about 10 or so. And having it set to two darkest pixel means that no matter how high your scaling is set to, the color shouldn't bleed past your line art. Adjust these settings as necessary. If you use really thin line art or line art with transparency, this might not work as well, but for me, who uses really thick solid black inks, this is the perfect method. Also, refer multiple means that the fill bucket looks at all the visible layers when deciding where to fill. If you have this turned off, your fill bucket might not work properly and fill in areas where you don't want it to. 
You can accomplish the same thing by setting your line art layer as a reference layer, but having this setting turned on in the fill bucket means you don't have to mess with setting up reference layers every single time. If you tend to leave gaps in your line art, you can check off close gap and it'll automatically fill in any holes. The higher you set it, the larger gaps this will work on. You might have to go back and adjust a little because this tool isn't flawless, but it's still way easier and faster than coloring everything manually. Now, two more helpful things for flatting, the remove dust tool and the adjust line width tool, my other best friends. Sometimes when you use the fill bucket to color, you'll end up with little nuggets of uncolored spaces in tight corners. And yes, you can manually go in and fill those yourself, but that's tedious and annoying, so let's make it faster and easier. For smaller stuff, I usually use the Remove Dust tool. Make sure to select the Fill Leftover option, set the dust size to maximum, set the mode to fill transparent gaps with surrounding color, and make the brush size nice and big. Once that's set up, I go to my flats layer and just swipe this brush over the entire canvas. It'll look for any unfilled areas between your flat colors and fill them in by grabbing the surrounding colors and filling in the gaps. Again, sometimes it may grab the wrong color and you'll have to go in and spot treat it, but it still saves a ton of time compared to doing all of it manually. Now, sometimes the unfilled areas are too big for the remove dust tool to fix, which is when we break out the big guns, the adjust line width tool. What I like to do for character flats is to turn off my background stuff, make a selection of all the negative space around my characters, then invert the selection so only my characters are selected. Grab the Adjust Line Width tool, set it to Thicken, crank it up to 11, turn off the line art layer, and go to town with this tool until the flats are completely filled in behind the line art. The selection means it won't go outside of your lines, and you can really quickly fill in all the gaps without having to think about it too much. If you've ever seen a weird green highlight effect happen during one of my speed paints, that's me using this tool. Again, sometimes the wrong color will end up slightly outside of where it was supposed to go, but you can go back and make adjustments manually afterwards. Easy peasy, and I just saved you hours of time. You're welcome. So like I said, I do all my character flats on one layer. My background flats, I break up a little more sometimes because my backgrounds tend to be a bit more painterly. Usually the sky is on its own layer and I'll have a few layers of flats depending on the environment. I also organize my layers a bit at this point. I make a folder for my characters with their ink and flats layers and a folder for my backgrounds also with their own inks and flats. After all the flats are laid out, it's time for rendering. I usually do my background rendering first because it's like eating your vegetables before eating your dessert. I get the backgrounds out of the way first and then have fun with the character shading. I mostly use multiply layers to add shadows and overlay or soft light layers to add highlights, but again, it tends to change depending on the lighting of the scene. I made a whole tutorial about my coloring and rendering process a while back, so I'll leave the link for that in the description. After the backgrounds are rendered, now it's time to do the characters. I use a single multiply layer for all the base cell shading, an overlay layer for highlights, another multiply layer for things like blush on the skin, and everything else changes depending on the lighting of the scene. I also usually put the white eye shines and their own layer on top of the line art. So once that's done, I have a fully rendered comic page, but okay, here's the thing. Some people are color savants, and by this point in the process, their pages will already look finished and beautiful. I am not one of those people. At this stage, my pages look a little weird at best and horribly jacked up at worst. So now comes my favorite part, the final render, do 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 do, AKA attacking the page with an airbrush and effect layers until it looks nice. <laughs> Again, this is the type of thing that gets changed every scene depending on the lighting and will even change page to page depending on what the lighting calls for. But this final step is really where all the colors start to come together. I'll select one panel at a time, take the main light color of the scene, let's say a warm light yellow to represent the sunlight, and just softly airbrush it over the scene where it looks like the light would be the strongest. Like with real spray painting, you want multiple low opacity strokes instead of one single heavy handed stroke. I'll set this layer to overlay and just build up the light where I want it. Then I'll make a new layer for another color and do the same thing. I'll also add vignettes at this stage with the same technique, but using multiply layers instead. I'll also use adjustment layers like gradient map set to a low opacity, color balance, or a brightness contrast filter to tweak the colors and get them just right. 
This part is very much trial and error, but once I have it in a place I like it for one page, I can usually just repeat the settings over the rest of the pages in the scene. And again, sometimes I'll adjust things based on how the page looks once I'm done. It's hard to explain the thought process behind it, but to summarize, this is just the step where I do what comes naturally and try to mold the colors to the vibes I want for a page. It's very much freestyling at this step. Yay, art. <laughs> After that, the page is done, which means it's time to export. And remember how I said that you should always draw your pages super duper big? Yeah, you don't actually wanna post them online at full size. When you're posting your pages online, you'll wanna shrink them down so they don't take a million years to load. Most comic platforms usually have a maximum width of about 900 pixels, and if you're posting on your own site, I wouldn't recommend going much over that. In Clip Studio, you can select export as a single layer and input how big you want the exported version of your page to be. Pick a spot to save the file in and presto, it's done. One fresh comic page hot off the presses and ready for reading. In like two months, because I usually work on pages well before I actually post them. I hope you guys enjoyed the sneak peek of this page that most folks won't get to see for another month. <laughs> and yeah, that's basically it. That's the full breakdown of how I make comics. If seeing this page made you interested in reading the rest of the comic, remember that you can read the entirety of my webcomic cast off for free at castoff-comic.com. Link is down in the description. And again, if you want to see me draw pages like this in real time, you can always stop by my weekly art streams. If you want even more webcomic tips and advice from yours truly, not only do I have a ton of other videos on the topic on my channel, I also wrote an entire book about it. Check out my book, How to Web Comic, The Ultimate Guide to Making Online Comics on my store now. It has tips and advice for drawing comics, as well as writing, marketing, where and how to post pages, and even how to monetize your work. I basically crammed everything I know about comics into this thing, so go check it out. Link is down in the description. Lastly, if you want to start making your comics yourself, I highly recommend trying out Clip Studio Paint. I really only scratched the surface of what this program can do in this video, and they've got a ton of resources, guides, and tutorials available to help you learn how to use the program to its fullest potential. I've been using it for years, and at this point, it's hard to imagine using anything else. And hey, if you want to test out the software and see if it's right for you, you can download a free trial of Clip Studio Paint from their website. Link is in the description down below. And huge thanks again to Clip Studio Paint for sponsoring this video. And that about does it for this one. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I hope that it was helpful to my aspiring comic artists out there. Let me know in the comments what kind of comics you're working on. Make sure to subscribe if you want more videos like this in the future, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye!